Okay, we're going to get started this morning. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started. Good morning. Good to have everybody. <laughs> Good to have everybody here. It was a little slimmer in the first service. Uh, I'm not sure if it's because it's Mother's Day or I, I know a lot of people actually. There's gone through another wave of COVID. Um, so Josie and her whole family are out. That's why Steve and I were helping lead music today. My, one of my poor sons, Tobin, who usually runs the sound, got married last Sunday and then went to, the San, went to the San Juan Islands for his honeymoon and was sick the whole time with COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're going to they're gonna have another one, uh, another. They were planning another trip, like to London or something, so, so hopefully they'll be all right. Well, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for this morning. We, uh, we ask your blessing in, uh, on our study of your word and about your word. And we pray for those who are uh, struggling through illness and, and COVID. And we, uh, we also want to thank you for mothers and for the, for the message. Uh, that Ed brought us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week we, uh, we talked about the role of the Old Testament, um, the Hebrew scriptures, and the uh, important connection between the story uh, of the Old Testament and how that connects and works through the story of the New Testament and how both of those uh, are very important uh, for us to understand the, the bigger picture. Uh, today we're going to spend uh, our time looking at the issue of inspiration of Scripture, authority of Scripture, because the two verses we're looking at are very central to that discussion uh, in the history of the church and the history of, of doctrine as well. So I'm going to go ahead and read um, from verse 14 through the end of chapter 3 of Second Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you've learned it, how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Now, most of us don't probably spend a lot of time thinking uh, about the issue of, of inspiration and authority, but it is a, it is a pretty central uh, doctrine and, and thing to kind of know a little bit about. Um, I teach a hermeneutics class, and a lot of times we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about this issue there and the questions that kind of come up from that. Uh, and, you know, most of us probably can't really explain how, how does inspiration work? You know, what's the relationship between how God inspires things and how, you know, the men, the apostles wrote um, the books that we have or the Old Testament books. The, and, uh, you know, we have other religious traditions that have inspired scriptures as well, right? So we, we have the Quran in, in Islam, you have the Book of Mormon, and you have the Hindu Vedas, you have all kinds of other scriptures in different traditions, and people see those, you know, people who are in those traditions see those as inspired as well in some way. So we want to kind of know, what, you know, how, is, how are the scriptures different um, from that? And so on my sheet there, how can we be sure of its authority? You know, we're talking about inspiration, but we're also talking about the authority of Scripture. When faced with a critical decision or personal struggle, how do we know for sure that when we read and study the Scriptures or do our devotions that God is speaking to us? Is the Bible authoritative in all that it says concerning faith and practice or history? I mean, there are all different areas that people think about as far as, you know, how do we extend the idea of inspiration? To what point do we extend it? So those are just a few of the questions, and I actually have a, another handout. Um, I just put a couple on the tables there so you could, could share with others. I didn't want to make 60-some copies, which I normally make. But, uh, you know, when I teach a class on this, the, at the bottom of that page it says issues in inspiration and authority. Right? 
Uh, I don't pretend that everybody wants to unpack it to this point, <laughs> but some people do like to focus on these questions, right? What exactly is it that is inspired? The writers, is it the writers that are inspired? So then, you know, you have this question, well, then is everything they write inspired? Um, you know, Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans, which we don't have, it's mentioned in the book of Colossians. Uh, was that inspired? Well, we don't have it. Um, how is the dictation theory inadequate? We're going to talk about that. We're going to look at five different views of inspiration. Uh, what do we mean by the terms that are used for, for inspiration? Inerrancy, infallibility. What is that word? Plenary. I remember from my college class, my, it was actually my, my pastor at the church I worked at in Long Beach, California for 10 years, and he was teaching his class, and he introduced this word plenary. I was like, oh, okay. What's that mean? Uh, extending to all parts equally. I remember that from the class. Um, should the concept of inspiration of Scripture be limited to issues of faith and practice or be extended also to matters of science, history, and chronology? That's a big question within evangelical scholarship. Um, can one put too much of an emphasis on the Bible? Is bibliolatry a valid issue of concern, right? Anybody know what bibliolatry means? Worshiping the Bible, right? Yeah. Um, what are the implications of the common evangelical statement that inspiration is limited to the autographs or original manuscripts? So typically when you're reading a statement of faith from a, a conservative church, um, and usually it's the first statement in, in that list, uh, they will often say it's inerrant in the original manuscripts, right? They'll have a kind of a caveat there. Um, which creates a little bit of an issue because we don't have the autographs, right? We don't have the originals. So, if the words of Scripture are inspired, why did God not oversee and protect the grammar, editing, copying, translating Scripture? So there are a lot of little issues there. If you ever, in depth, you know, study Scripture, you'll see uh, issues like that. Um, can traditional Christian theology be inspired even if a certain doctrine or practice is not specifically outlined in Scripture? So we have people in our class who come from, say, a Presbyterian or Reformed tradition or a Lutheran tradition, right, that believe in infant baptism. Uh, so it's not clearly spelled out, right, in the Bible. So Christians differ on that. Um, there's no, like, smoking gun verse about the Trinity, um, except one that was introduced in the 1500s in 1 John 5. <laughs> and it appears in the King James Version only, um, but... That's another whole story. Uh, should questionable textual passages such as Mark 16, 9 through 20, so if you were to look at the Gospel of Mark at the very end, uh, you'll see there's usually a little line in your Bible uh, right after verse 8, and then you have what we call the longer ending of Mark, right? So actually in the manuscript tradition, we have like five different endings of Mark, shorter ones and so on. So most of those are considered by even evangelical scholars to be added later to the book. So then what do you do with those words, right? Uh, words which talk about drinking poison, <laughs> right? Or casting out demons or speaking in tongues, right? Um, and then the woman, the story of the woman in adultery, that would be the other kind of main passage that's usually seen as uh, an authentic Jesus tradition, but not authentic to the Gospel of John. So you could look at your Bibles there, and you could see a little footnote at the bottom of, you know, John 7, 53, or at the end of 52. So these are a lot of issues. We're, we're not going to go into that, but uh, I did talk about that when we did the Gospels. Uh, are some canonical books more important than others? So some people today favor certain books, right, particularly in the New Testament. This is what we call a canon within the canon. Um, when was the last time you heard a sermon on the book of Jude? <laughs> I, I don't remember one. <laughs> this little book, you know, with, with like 20-some verses, which is dealing with a very specific issue in the early church. Uh, people tend to stay away from that. But Romans? Well, goodness, you know, we spent a year on the book of Romans, right? Imagine spending a year in the book of Jude. No, thank you. Um, Philemon, great little book, all right? Paul's dealing with the issue of a runaway slave and Christian master. Um, 
And then finally, what should be our response to Christians who do not hold the same view of Scripture as we do? What would I do if I were asked to sign a statement of faith, which I disagreed with or had reservations about in the area of the inspiration of Scripture? So these are things that, that you know, some of us face. Like I've taught at five different colleges and seminaries, and they all have different statements of faith and inspiration. You have to read them carefully, and you have to kind of nuance your, your, your perspective, you know. So... Um, so as, we, as we're looking at this passage, it's, it's important to look at the wider context because these two verses, 16 and 17, are often kind of just taken out of the context because they're so important for the history of, of inspiration. Um, but we want to be careful of, uh, about proof texting, right? Proof texting is when you lift something out of its context. And as we say, a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. Should I say that again? A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. Okay? Um, there are circles of context, right? I've, I've talked about this in class. So you have a verse, and then you have sentences around the verse, and you have a paragraph around the verse, and you have a book that's around that, and then, you know, it kind of works its way out from there. And so, you know, we always want to see what's, what's the immediate context for what Paul is saying here. Um, so throughout the pastoral letters, Paul has been concerned not only with false teachers in the church, but with those who use the scriptures in wrong ways or for wrong purposes. Okay, so not just false teachers, but just teachers in general there. He cautions against individualistic interpretations which emphasize idiosyncratic doctrines which don't align with the historic and corporate rule of faith. Okay? Uh, Paul's all con uh, very concerned about the idea of continuity in the church, that there are these traditions of, of belief and doctrines that kind of, you know, they, they don't even start just in the New Testament. They start in, in the story of God in the Old Testament, and they work their way through. Um, and so when you come across people who have these very innovative views of certain things or of certain passages, that's kind of a red flag because you have this long tradition now of the church in the history of doctrine. Um, and so when people introduce new things, uh, we, we want to be careful. You know, we want to test that. And so one of the reasons Paul left Timothy in Ephesus was so that he may, quote, instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine, not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine training that is known by faith. I mean, you can, you can go on YouTube, and, and, and it's unbelievable how many weird interpretations you see and how many pastors are just teaching things that are just, wow, you know, where did that come from? You know, uh, and so this is why you have this warning in James, which I put on your sheet there. Um, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And this is the one that really gets me. For all of us, and I think he means all of us teachers, make many mistakes. Okay, I can take we make mistakes, but like many mistakes? Oh. Huh. That's, that's, that's harsh. In that word, teachers can also mean pastors. What? In that verse, James 3, 1, 2, he's pointing a teacher. Pastors? Um, well, like Ephesians uh, does have a list that says pastors slash teachers. Um, we have to remember that in the early church, there really wasn't like a local pastor leader for, for a long time, Right. There were traveling evangelists and prophets and teachers, and so they went from church to church. And that makes it even more important that everybody's on the same page, right? And this is why we have problems uh, in the New Testament period, because you've got people spreading these views from different churches to different churches. I mean, when you read Galatians, right? I mean, Paul's very concerned about that. You know, if I or an angel of heaven comes to preach to you a different gospel, let them be... Accursed, anathema, you know, it's a very strong word. So, um, and so, you know, that's why we have this uh, commitment to scriptural consensus. The pastoral epistles display a strong emphasis on the importance of keeping in step with the received tradition, teachings handed down from Jesus and the apostles. 
grounded in the shared tradition of scriptural reading and interpretation. So if you remember that a lot of the tradition in the early church is not written tradition, it's oral tradition, right? It's being passed on orally from community to community, and eventually it gets written down. Um, but most people in the early church only heard things, right? They heard the word of God. Most of them couldn't read, and even if they could read, I mean, the, the scriptures take a long time to get copied, and it's expensive, and, uh, and so you would go to church so that you would hear the word of God read, right? So like in, in, Rome, in Revelation 1, blessed is the one who reads, and blessed, is, blessed are the hearers, plural, right? There's one person sitting in front of the church reading this book of Revelation, and everyone is hearing. So, um, accordingly, those who offer unique or peculiar interpretations of biblical texts are naturally considered suspect, not in line with received re- teaching of the church. Paul speaks positively of Timothy's generational heritage of Jewish faith handed down from grandmother to mother to child and how from infancy Timothy has known the Holy Scriptures. Okay, so there's this, this continuity and tradition there from Old Testament through to the story of Jesus in the New Testament. In addition, Titus, so we're talking about the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. Titus is instructed that any potential elder must have a firm grasp of the word that is trustworthy in accordance with, and in the Greek, it's, it's the teaching. Right? It's not just teaching, it's the teaching. This teaching that's been passed on right, from Jesus to the apostles and now to disciples of the apostles, in this case, Timothy and Titus. In fact, the teaching ministry of the church is emphasized more in these three letters, in the pastoral letters, than anywhere else in the New Testament. Okay, Because we're talking about the end of an era. We're talking about the end of Paul's ministry, where now you know the apostles are, are, are gone. A lot of them are gone or, or been martyred. And so what, what's happening is you have this next generation, and, and, and they're wanting to pass on these traditions to these people, faithful people, just like Moses to to Joshua, right, in the Old Testament. Um, So, where are we at? In fact, the teaching, I already read that. Along with a focus on public reading, so I mentioned that, of Scripture, centrality of the Word of God is a fundamental basis for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. This overall background and context is essential for understanding the last quotation, so our passage, right? we always have to kind of think corporately when we're looking at these texts, a corporate body of Christ and, uh, and how inspiration and teaching works within the body. So when we get to this verse 16, all scripture, and that's the NRSV uh, translation, but some translations have every scripture um, because it's, it's ambiguous in the Greek. It could be all scripture or it could be every scripture, meaning every passage, right? Um, and... So all scripture would be everything that was accepted as canonical or inspired. Every passage means every verse of scripture. And uh, even though earlier Paul has already talked about the, the sacred writings, so he's talking about it collectively of the canon of scripture that, you know, the Jewish Hebrew scriptures. Um, the context here and, uh, and the fact that as you go through the pastoral letters and particularly leading up to our passage here, Paul has been referring to specific Old Testament texts, right? From, from Exodus and from Numbers and from, from other passages. Um, kind of suggests that Paul is saying here that every passage of Scripture is kind of his emphasis there. And this, this may be partly because the false teachers are also emphasizing certain passages, Right? Or, or maybe they have a canon within the canons, like, you know, we like this book, but, you know, Leviticus, forget about it, um, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and Paul's saying, no, every passage. And, of course, when you say every passage, uh, by definition, now you're saying all Scripture as well, right? So it covers that. Um, you're, you're transferring or conveying authority from the part to the whole. And similar to what Paul says in Romans 15, 4 there on the quote, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction so that by the steadfastness and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Um, now the other thing then as we move on is, is what the purpose of scripture is. And, and Paul's going to 
talk about how scripture is useful, right? And so the idea of the application. And the emphasis here is really on the practical function of scripture within the corporate life of the church. Uh, Paul's not emphasizing here like this, this theoretical head knowledge or theological dogma. Um, in the first letter, the first Timothy letter, uh, the aim of instruction and training in God's word was to instill and promote, quote, love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. And, and it's interesting because there's this phrase that Paul uses in, in the pastoral letters, um, which is sound doctrine. You know, and literally the word sound is, is it's a, like a medical term. It's healthy, healthy doctrine. This, is, this creates conditions for growth within the body of Christ. It's different from these false teachers, right? And it's always been fascinating to me that when you go through the pastoral letters and you look at every section or every verse where Paul talks about sound doctrine, it's never doctrine the way we think of doctrine. It's, it's not like he's, you know, reciting the creed or even a statement of faith. Um, it's not an intellectual component of some belief system. Um, and so for Paul, it's, it's when we read scripture and when scripture is read in church, it's a performative function of scripture, right? What kind of person does God's word create as opposed to what do you know? What do you know? So, you know, I, I put all the, the characteristics where Paul talks about sound doctrine, uh, love from a pure heart, a good conscience, sincere faith, honoring marriage, enjoying creational life with thanksgiving, respecting elders, honoring and providing for widows, slaves respecting serving masters, being content with basic necessities of life, temperate, serious, prudent, sound in faith, love and endurance, reverent, not slanderers, not addicted to much wine, uh, <laughs> loving one's husband and children, self-controlled, chaste, good household managers. I mean, those are all very real, practical things, right? Um, so Paul's very concerned here that as we study Scripture, as we read Scripture, as we infuse Scripture uh, within our lives, that this is worked out in practical activities in the church. So then, um, in the rest of verse 16, he talks about four functions of Scripture. Um, and there are four prepositional phrases there. So, if you ever take Greek, um, this works kind of in English, too. So, prepositions, we use this kind of circle thing. So, like, in, the word in, in Greek, you know, it's in the circle. Uh, but Paul is using a word pros here four times to this, to this, to this, to this. This is what the purpose and the usefulness of Scripture is. So that means you're, you're moving in a direction towards something, right? Um, or another one, upon, you know. This is how I learned my Greek prepositions. Uh, out of, you know, you're working out of the circle, um, and so on. So these four things, and, and it's interesting because they're, it's, it's, um, it's kind of what we call a chiasm. You guys know what that is? Chiasm? Okay, so chi is a Greek letter X, right? So a lot of times in, in the Old Testament, especially the prophets do this, where they're emphasizing certain things and there's a pattern to it, right? And so here we have um, teaching, right? Then what? Rebuking, is it correcting? Correcting, all right, and training, all right? So you see how these are bookends here and these two are kind of in the middle? Um, that the, the focus really is on, okay, we, we want to teach. Uh, the focus isn't just on, oh, get after people <laughs> and rebuke them and correct them, but within the teaching function and the training function of the church, uh, that's where correction uh, and rebuking should, should fit. Uh, and while these verses, uh, I think, can apply to all believers, we also have to think about the fact that Paul is addressing Timothy very specifically here as someone who's going to carry on his ministry, right? Right? 
uh, and his role within the church. So, and so Paul uses this phrase, man of God, that the man of God, and he actually uses this in 1 Timothy 4 as well, you, Timothy, man of God. Now, if, if you've grown up in Judaism your whole life and you've read the Old Testament, you know that that phrase is typically specific to something, right? The man of God it could be Moses. It could be a prophet. Uh, it's someone commissioned by God. It's someone given a special task by God. And so I think here he has Timothy uppermost in his mind as one who will take over his vocation of gospel preaching and church planning. As Towner, Towner's a good uh, a commentary this thick on the pastoral epistles. Um, Paul is outfitting Timothy in order to be fully equipped for apostolic ministry. So then we get to the important question of, okay, so how do you understand inspiration? What, what does that mean? And there's a term that Paul uses here, um, which is only found here, and it's probably something that he coined. Uh, Paul sometimes would, would put words together, what we call compound words, uh, and create these words, and we don't have it anywhere else. Theo, we all understand what that, what is that? God, right? And neustos is, is similar to the word for, the word for spirit, pneuma, where we get the word pneumatic, right? When you're, you're blowing up a balloon or a tire, um, you know, we use a pneumatic tool for that. And so uh, the word neustos there has this sense of blowing or breathing on or infusing with something, right? So God has infused the scriptures um, and, and breathed them and divinely created them in, in, in a way. And, and so we want to kind of understand what does that mean? So your translations will often say God breathed. Um, some of them will just say inspired, right? But I think it's, it's, it's more interesting to see this bigger picture of God kind of, <sighs> right, blowing in. It's almost like when you're reading the creation story, you know, the, 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 the spirit, the ruach blows uh, it's like a wind on, in, in the, in the, over the, the darkness and so on there. Uh, so this indicates that the source of Scripture's inspiration comes from God, although Paul doesn't really explain how that works um, and to what extent Scripture is inspired, authoritative. So in the history of, of Christian doctrine, there basically have been kind of five positions on Scripture, and they kind of move from more literal to to less literal. So more literal would be what we call a dictation theory, okay? And this is the idea that the writers of scripture are um, kind of like stenographers. They're kind of like secretaries. It's like God says, okay, write this. I want it to be just like this, exactly like this, right? And you're just here to write it down. Um, and you, you do see this view sometimes in some of the early church writers. Um, they see the the they use an analogy like the, the writer is a plectrum, a pick, a guitar pick. <laughs> God's going, okay, we're going to play this string now. Um, but it's not really a very common view today uh, within the evangelical community. There's a few Pentecostal, kind of separate Pentecostal groups that sometimes hold to that. And, and the reason is that the writers of Scripture themselves don't seem to, to look at inspiration in that way. So in the preface to his gospel, Luke says, it seemed good to me, and I too decided to write. Um, Paul, at the moment of writing scripture, like 1 Corinthians, can say to the Corinthians, he can't remember who else he baptized when he was there. And it's like the Holy Spirit doesn't say, yeah, well, you also baptized Fortunatus and Achaeus and, you know. Uh, more fundamentally, as one moves from author to author and from book to book, the different personalities, varying cultural contexts, and levels of language skills clearly come through. Luke obviously knows and writes Greek better than John of Revelation. Okay, Luke, grows, grown up in a Greek culture, knows the language from birth. John is Jewish, knows Hebrew, knows, speaks Aramaic, is writing Greek as like a second language. You know, and, and you know that I did my doctorate on the book of Revelation. And, and John sometimes just, you know, if I was grading papers, <laughs> this is like, hey, John, your subject verb agreement here doesn't work, you know. Sometimes it's actually intentional, but um, this little book I mentioned earlier, Seven Things I Wish Christians Knew About the Bible, 
he talks about this. Uh, dictation theory removes the human element of scripture by denying that the personas of the authors shine through the text. And at the risk of sounding irreverent, if God dictated the Greek of the book of Revelation, then to be honest, God seriously needs some remedial grammar lessons because the Greek of Revelation is rough and clunky. Okay? Clunky. <laughs> it's interesting, but it's clunky. Yeah. Um, there's a... There's another good quote I think I'll read from this f book I used to use for a Gospels class, Four Gospels, One Jesus by Richard Burridge, who's an English evangelical scholar. Um, is the repeated use of words like composition and creativity just a polite way of implying that the Gospel writers made it all up? These are genuine concerns sometimes expressed to scholars. While they may be very understandable, such comments presume that the scriptures were dictated by God without any human involvement. The human authors are reduced to mere robots taken over by God and used simply as writing machines. If this were the case, then words like criticism and composition would indeed be out of place. However, I do not believe that such a view of inspiration is really a Christian understanding. Such notions of automatic writing and possession are more akin to occult practice. And while ideas of divine dictation are found in some other holy books, okay, so the Quran would be an example of this, right? The Quran is divinely dictated by Allah to Muhammad or his wife. Um, this is not, this does not occur in the Bible itself. The New Testament itself might help here. As we have seen, Luke begins with an author's preface similar to those found throughout classical literature. His reason for writing a gospel is apparently a human decision. Having looked at other people's accounts, it seemed good to me, or I too decided. Um, 2 Peter 1.21 suggests that scriptural prophecy is a combination of human and divine authorship when people moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And the word used there implies being lifted or carried, not being driven or compelled. Inspiration, not domination. Okay? Paul talks about this too in 1 Corinthians 14, where he talks about, I'll sing with the Spirit, but I'll sing with my mind also. I'll pray with the Spirit, but I'll also pray with my mind. Right? There's a balance there. The second view, inerrancy, which probably most of us have, are familiar with that word. Um, and so when you're reading about this, uh, there are actually different views of inerrancy. So you have kind of two basic versions. One which considers all statements in Scripture to be without error. So there's this word plenary, right, extending to all parts equally. And one which extends inerrancy only to issues of faith and doctrine, and that's called theological inerrancy. Historically, the doctrine of inerrancy is of a recent development. So this is something that was a reaction to this, you know, the earliest uh, some of the really good biblical scholars came out of Germany, right? And then out of Germany, they went to Britain, and out of Britain came the United States, you know, influenced um, from Germany to us. And, uh, and so the doctrine of inerrancy kind of is, is something that you see and read about in the late 1800s, early 1900s, kind of developing. And then when you, you, you look at this kind of reaction to liberalism, uh, they created what we call the five fundamentals, Right, so you've heard the word fundamentalist, right? Uh, didn't used to be a nasty word, an F word. Um, now we, you know, people call themselves evangelicals because they don't want to be known as fundamentalists. And now people are even going, well, I'm not sure I want to be even an evangelical. Um, <laughs> so just this, this progression there. Um, and so the inerrancy of scripture was, was one of the classic kind of five fundamentals of the faith. One of the effects of this is that most Protestant statements of faith now begin with a statement on the authority and inspiration of Scripture. Um, whereas they used to begin with a Trinitarian emphasis on God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So when you look down through history, you look at statements of faith or the creeds or whatever, right? God, Christ, Holy Spirit, church. Um, there aren't typically statements on Scripture until, until later in, in the history of the church. Um, and the standard formulation in these statements of belief is that the scriptures are inerrant in the original manuscripts. So what are the implications of that, since we don't have a single original manuscript? Um, 
Well, God works through that, right? I, I remember talking to a missionary from Papua New Guinea, they were Lutheran missionaries at the Lutheran school I used to teach at, and, and they said that the only translation they had of a New Testament book was a translation of the Gospel of Mark, and it was horrendous. It was terrible. And people were coming to Jesus, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and of course, yeah, okay, let's get someone in there who knows Greek better and translate it better. But God can still work through it. Um, infallibility. Now, that sounds very similar to inerrancy, but it's, it's not quite the same. Uh, this view is often equated with inerrancy, but there are some differences to be discerned in the use of it in many statements of faith. So I used to teach at Trinity Lutheran College. I'm not Lutheran, um, but they let me in anyway. Uh, so their statement of faith, which is on that other sheet I gave you as well, says the Bible is the only sufficient and, then they use this word, infallible rule and standard of faith and practice. So this and other infallibility statements often add that last phrase, in faith and practice, because it's a very purposeful reason for adding that, uh, as a way of limiting the idea of the inspiration of Scripture, okay? Limiting to spiritual or ethical issues. Um, with the implication that scripture's main role is not to teach us about science, medicine, geography, etc. Uh, and, and there are some issues to think about there, okay? Because the biblical writers, and a matter of fact, writers all the way up till, till the period of Luther, they were all geocentric. They all thought the earth was the center of the universe, right? God doesn't inform them about science ahead of time. Um, and so when you're reading and studying, say, the book of Genesis, you have to kind of consider that. Uh, God works with, and we've talked about that in this class, as a divine accommodation, right? That God works with people where they're at and their understanding in the culture and the, and the, and the, the science of that period, okay? Um, like inerrancy, this term has a drawback of being a negative rather than a positive formulation, okay? Inerrant, infallible. It's kind of, why are we using negative terms? But it, it's become very common. While many evangelical scholars are hesitant to use these terms for this and other reasons, personally, I don't have a problem with the basic intent of statements which focus the purpose of Scripture to matters of faith and practice. Because that's what Paul's doing here in Second Timothy, Right? He's focusing the inspiration of Scripture to these very practical matters within the church and the growth of believers. Number four, Scripture is inspired and authoritative. This view is probably closest to what Scripture actually reveals about itself. Okay? So we want to know what, what does Scripture say about itself? Well, it doesn't use terms like infallible. It doesn't use terms like inherent. Um, but it does use terms like inspiration and authority. Where Paul speaks to his associate Timothy about their common heritage of sacred writings in to, into which God has breathed, right, and which have a performative purpose, to make one wise for salvation and intended for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness. This training and righteousness is not a theoretical concept of justification. I mean, that's something that Paul does talk about, say, in the book of Romans. Um, but the word righteousness here is very similar to what Jesus says in, in um, the Sermon on the Mount. It's a very practical kind of living out righteousness, righteous living. Um, so more traditional biblical understanding of righteousness as godly living, wisdom as the practical application of knowledge, or if we want a theological term, you can use the, the word sanctification. Of course, this is something that Paul sees as the work of the Spirit in the believer and the community of faith, with the Word of God and Scripture as its content. Now, there are some people who see Scripture as, as very important, uh, and they will use the word inspirational, right? Different from inspired, but it's inspirational. In the same sense that, you know, all you know, classical literature could be inspirational. So, uh, like Shakespeare, Homer, Tolstoy, Tolkien, uh, these, these books that we read and are, are sometimes required to read <laughs> in school, right? Um, they have these timeless human themes. They have these interesting characters that can teach us. Uh, they inspire us. They entertain us. They teach us. They challenge us. Um, so, if you ever took a Bible is Lit class in, in high school or college, that would be the perspective, right? The Bible is inspirational. Um, but it's not 
usually seen as a special revelation from God. It's not seen as authoritative in the way that we as believers would want to see it. And so it's a, it's a very different worldview. And so like I say right at the end there, of course, this would be a sub-Christian view of Scripture. Okay? So if you go back to that other sheet, um, example, I put some example creeds, confessions, statements of faith there. Um, so Westminster Confession, that's what we would call the Reformed tradition, so like the Church of England or Presbyterian tradition, any kind of Calvinist tradition usually holds on to the Westminster Confession. Uh, all 66 books, Old Testament, New Testament, are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith in life. The authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed depends not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. And therefore it is to be received because it is the word of God. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture. Our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. Now, when you move to the, like, the Catholic tradition, Roman Catholic tradition, so the Second Vatican Council is um, early 60s. Um, so there were a lot of changes, actually, in, in the Catholic Church at that time period, which a lot of Catholics didn't like. So you have Mel Gibson, for example, who didn't like it and creates his own little Catholic church in Malibu. Flies in a priest from Seattle. Yeah. In composing the sacred books, God chose men uh, and while employed by him, made use of their powers and abilities so that with him acting in them and through them, they as true authors, so notice it's saying this not dictation theory, right? Consigned to writing everything and only those things which he wanted. Therefore, since everything asserted by the inspired authors or sacred writers must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, it follows that the books of Scripture must be acknowledged as teaching firmly, faithfully, and without error that which God wanted put into the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. For the sake of our salvation, right? Faith and practice, kind of similar to that. So one Lutheran position... Um, let's have a little booklet, Lutheran booklet. Lutherans hold to the word as supreme authority in religion. The important element here is that Lutherans do not equate the word of God with scripture. It is a living word transmitted through scripture, through Christ, through the sacraments, through preaching, through the life of the church. In whatever way God communicates himself to and pledges himself to his people, that could be called God's word. Luther claimed that whenever scripture speaks of Christ, it is of supreme worth, and when it doesn't, it is of no more value than any other great literature. So if you ever read anything on Luther, he could have some very negative views about certain books in the Bible, like Chronicles or Esther, Esther James, an epistle of straw, right? Because he's comparing James with Romans. Um, matter of fact, in his translation of the New Testament, the, the, some of the last books of the New Testament are kind of in, a, in an appendix, really. They're not seen as, as, as plenarily inspired. Um, God's activity does not stop with the biblical record or Bible times. It continues. He continues to move through human history, through his people, through his world. The, the Bible provides a norm and standards. This is where the word canon comes in. Right, canon is the word for a standard or a rule. We have a ruler with a beginning and an end, and this is what you, you evaluate things by, uh, by which activity may be tested, whether or not it is of God. It is interesting that when you read Luther's writings that he often complained about how we don't focus enough on the Holy Spirit and the role of the Spirit uh, in the church. And we usually associate that more with like in a later Pentecostal traditions. Um, Trinity Lutheran College, we read that earlier. Puget Sound Christian College, is Steve still here? Do you leave? Okay. So Steve Mall, who's, you know, leading with me, we both taught for years at Trinity Lutheran College. Um, oh, sorry, not Trinity, Puget Sound Christian College. So that comes from the Christian Church, Church of Christ tradition, which I grew up in. <clears throat> 
The Bible is the inspired word of God, is authoritative for all matters of Christian faith and practice. Uh, does PSCC hold to the doctrine of inerrancy? Although we may avoid the use of the non-Bible term inerrancy, we affirm the full authority and inspiration of the Bible. We do not believe it contains errors. If correctly interpreted, the Bible is an infallible guide for all matters of Christian faith and practice. Okay, so you see a little bit of the limitation there. Uh, Camino Chapel statement of faith. The supernatural and complete inspiration of the scriptures that they are without error, that their teaching and authority are absolute, supreme, and final. And then finally, I, I added a little Bob Jones University. Uh, my apologies to anybody who graduated from Bob Jones, but... And, and I didn't capitalize these. This, this, I've just put it the way it is. We believe a fundamentalist is a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ who maintains an immovable allegiance to the inerrant, infallible, and verbally inspired Bible, believes that whatever the Bible says is so, judges all things by the Bible, and is judged only by the Bible. Okay. Now, I, I'm curious where the word Christian went here. You know, they weren't first called fundamentalists at Antioch. They were first called Christians. And are we judged by the Bible at the end? Who are we judged by? By God, by Jesus Christ, right? So this is on the way to what I would call bibliolatry, okay? Not that everybody who went to Bob Jones holds to that. <laughs> there are a lot of people that went to Bob Jones who reacted against that. Um, there are a lot of people who went to Bob Jones who now are gay. I've taught with two of them, right, in college, who just totally reacted to being put into this very strict kind of understanding. Um, well, I have a quote there at the bottom um, from myself. So years ago, my oldest son, Derek, who's a pastor in Reformed Tradition, the Roots Church, I'd mentioned, he said, Dad, what's your view of the inspiration of Scripture? Well, it took me three months and eight single-space pages <laughs> to explain that to him. And if you want a copy, you can email me. Um, so some of the stuff that's on here, uh, actually, I've, I've used from there. Um, so to address the issues of how and in what way Scripture is inspired and authoritative, we need to broaden the discussion. Many of the views of inspiration discussed above focus too narrowly on the words, sentences, writers, and propositional content of the Bible, rather than what the overall story of Scripture reveals to us about God, ourselves, and our world. Scripture is not simply a record of inspired words and ideas, but it represents a discourse or a dialogue, you know, a communication, personal communication, between the Creator and His creation. It is not just a divine speech, but a series of speech acts which points away from itself and records a series of divine human encounters in history, or better, his story. This witness passed on to us by faithful Jews and Christians was born through the double agency of divine and human initiative. Okay? So some people like to use the analogy of the incarnation of Christ as a way of explaining the inspiration of Scripture. I mean, it, it has some drawbacks, but it's kind of interesting to think about that Christ was fully God, fully human, right? Um, in which God worked in, through, in and through the messy lives of imperfect vessels without overriding their human wills, level of education, writing skills, scientific knowledge, etc. The tendency of dogmatic or over-literal views is to focus on the words, numbers, ideas, minutia of scripture rather than the big picture, the events, the story, the record of divine human relationships throughout salvation history. And that's, that's what I was trying to emphasize last week uh, in class. And uh, I want to quote, uh, close with this quote. There was a, a president of Cape and Ray Bible School in England, which was uh, just north of where we were in Manchester, England. He came to visit Camille Chapel years ago. Um, Charles Price, and uh, he actually came to our house, and he spoke at church, came to our house, had lunch, and very interesting guy. And he had this analogy uh, that he shared when he was here, which I, I copied out. 
uh, which I thought was really interesting. The reason for which we read and study the Word of God, the Bible, is not primarily in order to get to know the Bible. It is primarily to get to know Christ. That is why Jesus chastised the Jews in John 5.39. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Jesus said if you study the scriptures simply to know the scriptures, it makes you a Pharisee. It gives you a book with which you can hit people over the head. But that's all. Let me illustrate. I have a Nissan, and when I got my car, I got with it an instruction manual, and I read the instruction manual. But the reason why I read the instruction manual was not because I wanted to know all about the instruction manual. I had a better reason. I wanted to know all about the car. Now, of course, I could have read my manual every night before I went to bed, underlined the bits I liked. I could have joined the local Nissan Fellowship and gone every week gone every week to listen to an exposition of the manual. This week's subject is spark plugs. <laughs> Next week, tire pressures. I could have memorized the manual. I could have put it to music and sung it and produced a book called Nissan in Song. <laughs> if I was a fanatic, I could have gone to classes to study Japanese to read the manual in the original language. <laughs> so much for my Greek. But the day would come, having read my manual every night, having underlined it, having memorized it, having sung it, having joined the Nissan Club, having learned Japanese, the day would come that I would say, I'm sick and tired of this manual. Why? Because the purpose of the manual is to introduce me to the car. You can read this book from Genesis to Revelation. You can memorize it, and it can leave you utterly cold until you realize as the words of the hymn say, beyond the sacred page, we seek the Lord. Right? Scripture is God's tool to point us in the right direction to who he is, to who Jesus is, to who we are, you know, and how we relate to other people. Beyond the written word, there is the living word. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We love your word. We love to study it. We love to spend our time in your word. But if it doesn't change us, if it doesn't make us different people, if we don't perform your word in relation to other people, ourselves, even those who are our enemies, uh, it is not doing us any good. Help us to understand how your word works within us through your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.